So we wait for uh, several minutes to for, for him to come back. Oh yeah, hi Paul. <laughs> I'm yeah. <laughs> sure how far I got. Yeah, I think the last time you had, uh, for for me it's uh, the 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 spec, the like the one page spec. I think that's like. Oh uh, yeah, like? that, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, let me start again on this slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will leave it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So apologies for the uh, slight technical hitch there. The current version of the async ASPX spec is version two, and it's designed to have a file per application. And let's start out by looking at the spec in regards to that first statement, you know, on there, a file per application. Um, what is the definition of an application? An application in this context needs to be either an event producer or consumer, or in fact, both a producer and consumer. The actual application is not constrained to a particular device, server, or programming language, and might range from a tiny IoT constrained device to a room sized mainframe. But by consuming or producing events, it plays a role in the event driven architecture. All async API files start with a version of the specification being used. So as we can see here, version two. And by convention, the file hold in the config is named async api.json or async api.yaml, depending on the markup language or tool you're using to work with the specification with. For today's example use case, we're gonna use YAML, which personally I find a little easier on the eye, not to mention the brain than trying to process JSON. Uh, the structure of the file has four major sections. You can see these here, info, servers, channels, and components. And we're gonna dive into each of those in turn. First, when we say file, I should mention that references are supported within various parts of the specification, enable you to break configuration out to separate locations via a dollar ref tag. But conceptually, we say a single file per application. So let's start at the top. Let's start with the info object. This is where you define the metadata about your API, its name, its version, and description, et cetera, plus also any relevant contact and licensing information. Uh, and starting with this, which of course is a pretty simple object and easy to understand, we can introduce the concept of extensions. Now, a specification such as async API concentrate on what is reusable for a large range of use cases and technology. But of course, that means you may still have specific requirements which require you to extend what's supported in the core of the specification. And Async API provides you that mechanism via the extensions. To extend the definition with additional custom details, uh, and as an example, maybe in our info block, we wanna put a, a link to the uh, repository that holds the source code. We could do that as an extension Format-wise, the extension property is prefixed with a, an X and a hyphen to indicate it's an extension to the tools and, and other developers and consumers. Um, and that's how we would do that. Now, we won't actually be building an extension today, but hopefully you get the idea. And before we move on, though, I need to go back a step. At the top here, you'll see an ID um, and a, a mythical application. Um, although it's not mandatory, it's actually best practice to define a unique ID per async API specification document, because this allows you to uniquely identify this document. Um, you know, not just you, but other people. Oops. Um, now, apologies, I stepped forward. If we look into the info block, we can see that we've got contact information, licensing, et cetera, um, and even URLs defined for where that information will be returned or the contacts can be. Um, in this case, it's only my contact information that's actually valid, so please don't refer to the rest. Um, now I wanna take a look at the server object. The server object is not surprisingly where the details of the servers you can communicate with are located. That is where your consumer can interact with your application. And as shown here, the server definition may actually refer to a message broker or event source rather than a microservice application. And we're actually gonna be using a message broker as part of our demonstration. Our example shows two servers defined, you know, one for, for dev, which is mqtd.dev, 
and the second for MQTT which is actually a cloud hosted MQTT test server. Yeah, I think Paul is the screen is uh, freezing right now, having some technical issue. So, yeah, we'll wait for for him to come back. Yeah, that's the difference between virtual conferences and physical conferences. By the way, <laughs> uh, uh, these kind of technical issues could happen sometimes. But at the meantime, you could uh, try to explore around the hopping platform, uh, go to the booth, go to find someone. To chat and yeah, look and and also you could try to uh, if you are want you if you want to stay with our developer track uh, that is for the whole day, uh, you could try to see what other sessions that you you may be interested in, and mark the time to come back. Yeah, I think Paul is coming back right now. Yeah, we'll wait for him. Great. Welcome back again, Paul. <laughs> so I guess the uh, the internet between from Sydney to Hong Kong is uh, less yeah. than optimal. <laughs> uh, so yeah. apologies for that. Let's. Yeah. The last thing you you're talking about is the MQTT part uh, from for my side. So you may want to. Okay. Was it this? Okay. Was it the server definition? I should keep going. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so as you can see, we have the servers defined here. Um, below the variables which we're going to substitute into the URL, we have the bindings. Uh, and here we have client ID and clean session actually defined. Now the bindings are where we can have the protocol specific information. Uh, this is will be different depending on which protocol you're using, and you may not actually need them. If you take a look at the second test server, you'll see that we don't actually have a binding object there because they're not currently um, not currently uh, using any of the additional information that's not in the standard spec. Okay. Next, we have the channel objects. And hopefully, the internet's not going to die on me here because the channel object is really one of the main components of the Async API definition as it defines the address, operation, and message objects that publishers can, can communicate to the server with. Depending on the core technology you're defining, the async API documentation for the channel could be referring to a topic, a routing key, event types, or path. Now, looking at our example here, we actually have two channels defined. The first for claim status, you can see that defined here, and the second, for claims processed. And as you can see, these are defined as hierarchical routes. So let's let's just drill into, into the channel and its component definitions a little bit further. Looking at claim status first, um, you can see we have both a publish and subscribe defined for this channel. Now, it's important to note, these two verbs are the only supported operation within any async API document. The operation objects for those verbs defines how messages are sent or received and also defines the message structure that is the format of those messages that are being communicated. This is really at the heart of building those reusable and understandable definitions. Now, you need to note that from Async API perspective, um, its perspective is from the application. So when I define pub or sub, it means how the application uh, would implement that. And I'll show you what I mean later when we implement a client. So if we look at more detail the publish operation, we can see that we've got the summary and operation ID. Summary field is obviously self-explanatory. Operation ID is a unique identifier for this channel. But what's not shown is you can also have further optional metadata, such as descriptions, tags, external documentation objects, and operation traits. 
And the operational traits can be reusable objects, which can then be applied to the operation. So they are common uh, capabilities. We also have the subscribe operation defined for the channel. Now, as you can see here, we have a reference to the message uh, from that operation. And in fact, it's the same for both operations in this channel. They're both using the same message. So if we go and look at that message now and actually look at the actual message object, which we referred to from the channel as a reusable asset, we see the message metadata, you know, its name, its title, its summary, its content type, et cetera. Um, and also the message structure. Now, in this case, we're actually again using reference. We're using from the payload a reference to the component schema message for status update, and you can see it there. Um, and that's then a common reusable asset between both of those operations. You could, of course, have a channel that supports multiple message, in which case you would define an array, or indeed they could have different message types. But just for example, we use the same. So as we've already mentioned, your applications might support multiple channels. In fact, our example has a second channel for claims processed within this defined document. Um, and for claims processed, you can see it's got a slightly different format here. We have defined the message payload directly in the operation. We haven't used a reference. Okay? And we've only defined a single operation. We've only defined a publish, not pub sub. You know, defining the message within, within the Operation is completely valid, but a different way of actually doing it from the reference in the components to inline. Okay, so. Yeah, I think Paul is having some connection issues right now. Yeah. So, um, great. So, actually, so after Paul's session, uh, we will have a short break which uh, you could just grab a quick lunch or uh, try to visit the booth, try to uh, uh, connect to somebody to have some networking. And after that, we'll, we'll go through other, other sessions. But now let's, uh, let us wait for Paul to come back. OK, Paul, you're back. <laughs> Yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting difficult to keep my thought track here, but let's keep going, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, component object is the last object I want to talk about. We've already used it for uh, schema and message um, use, and but as you can see, there are many other reusable objects we could define in the component object. Okay. Now we're going to jump to a demo now, which hopefully the internet's not going to crap out on me, so we can actually uh, see the demo run through. So let me just switch screens. OK, so this document may look familiar. Um, it's the actual document I've been building up, and hopefully you can piece together what I've been doing as I've gone along. We've got the ID, which is the reference for this document. We've got the info block with our contact information. We've got our servers, our bindings that we mentioned, the channels, both a pub sub for client claim status, and then a single publish for processed. And then lastly, we've got the components for the message and the schema definitions. Okay, uh, Just a level set before I do this uh, demonstration is I've already installed a, a uh, MQTT broker called Mosquito. It's open source, very fast. I'm running that locally. And I have installed um, uh, Node, Node.js, so that I can run actually run the demo. So first of all, let me just uh, start the broker. Okay, so the broker's up and running. That's the broker listening, waiting for messages. What I'm going to do now in this window is we can see we've got our claims.yaml. This is the async configuration file. I'm now actually going to generate the code to use this file. Um, and as long as I don't get any typos or my internet doesn't disappear, we should... Uh, we should get some progress here. So, async API. First part is, of course, the definition file. 
The next part is the template we want to generate the code for. So we're doing Node.js, so we choose Node.js template. Uh, we need to give it an output to directory, so I'm just going to call it Node, and we're going to pass in a parameter. The parameter here is um, actually the server we want to use. I mentioned earlier, we're going to use my local server, so that's MQTT dev. So, uh, and I can already see a typo, so let me just correct that. Type in and speak in, never been my strong suit, but let's see if that one works. Okay, done, easy as that, it's generated the code. If I go into, into the node subfolder we created, we can see it's pulled in all of the packages it needs to actually generate this. I'm gonna do an npm install to actually now install our application. Application is, is installed, it's came up with a couple of warnings, there's in fact one higher, so let's, let's be uh, good corporate citizens and, and fix that. Um, we don't want any security vulnerabilities catching us out. We've now just got two warnings about some missing metadata. I'm happy with that. I can live with that. Let's start our application. Okay, you may have noticed in the mosquito window up here that a new connection was made. So this is our, our actual uh, client connecting to the broker. The broker is our application in this context. Um, we can see that we subscribed to claim status. We've got a publishing channel for claim status and we've got Subscribe to claims processed. Now, remember I said the async API definition file is from the context of the application. So in that file, we defined publish, but you can see the client has subscribed. Hopefully that's clear. It sometimes be a bit confusing. So what I wanna do now is actually um, send a message. Let's see if we can receive it. I'm not gonna type this in because it includes JSON and I'll definitely get it wrong, but I'm just using a command line tool to actually publish a message to the broker. So the message will go from the broker, sorry, from the client to the broker and should be picked up by the node client we just created. So as we could see there, it, uh, and I didn't see it come in. Ah, oh, great. And that's good. It didn't come in because I had the wrong channel. I sent it to claims proc. Our application is not actually listening on that channel. So if I send it in now, you can actually see we've received the message. That's how easy it is to take an async API file, use code generators or the open source tools to actually start to use that definition. You know, that definition can be shared with other people and provide you with the capabilities that you need to really move forward. Let me just flip back to the slides now just to um, quickly recap what we just did there. So we created this uh, pseudo application for insurance claims. We created the definition file for it. We started our broker. We used the code generator via the AG command. AG, the name of the um, async KPR definition file. Now I deliberately went against, against best practice here and called it claims.yaml just to make a point in this demonstration. Normally that file would be called asyncapi.yaml or JSON as we mentioned. We then pass in the template that we want to generate the code for. We have the uh, output directory we sent it to, and then one of the parameters we picked up, depending on what you're working with, could be different. We then started to use uh, a standard CLI tool. This is nothing to do with async API, but an MQQT tool that we could publish messages to the broker and ensure that we had two-way uh, functionality there. Okay, um, so before we got to get to any questions, um, if you're interested in learning more about the ACNK API specification, and did I just lose myself again? So I'm not sure if you can still see me, Jackie, or if I disappeared. Yeah, I can, I can see you, Paul. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, I was just wrapping up anyway. Um, so I was just saying that if you want to learn more um, about the specification, uh, there's the resources on the web. You'll find a link to the GitHub code repo. Um, you know, it's got a Slack channel. It's very friendly, have a community call every two weeks. Um, and although version two of the async API has been around for over a year, there's still lots of work to do. So if yeah. you have an interest in that, you could certainly join in. 
Um, now, did we manage to retain an audience? And are there any questions I can answer at this time? Yeah. By the way, uh, we, we, we also have another session uh, in the, uh, I'm not sure whether it's afternoon for you, but for you guys, but uh, afternoon in, in at 2.10, uh, there's a session called Async API and Future of API Sex, also on this topic. So if uh, there's any interested audience, you could also go to that session. But uh, I have a quick question for you, uh, Paul. So actually, as you mentioned, the Async API has been for around one year. So the support, how, how is the support for the auto-generated SDK compared to Open API? As I heard from many developer friends, uh, Open API, the Open API code generators have started to be more mature. So more like uh, uh, you could take that to production users. Uh, how is that for, for async API? Um, yeah, so version two has been around for a year. Version one, which was not really used that much, was a bit longer. But I, I would say they're probably still immature, certainly compared to Open API, which has, of course, been mm -hmm. around a lot longer. Um, you will often find that if you look at them, say, for example, the Python um, generator, it will say it works against most use cases, but it doesn't support all functionality, and there may be some issues. So you really need to, to check what kind of mileage you're going to get. Um, it seems that Node.js one is more is more mature than others. Mm, great. Okay. So okay, thank you, thank you, Paul, for for your quick introduction to async API. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I think that's uh, uh, about it for the for the morning sessions. So uh, we are now entering the bake breaks. Which you could try to grab a quick, uh, grab, grab some quick food, and go to network with somebody. Try to visit the booths and look for sessions that you may be interested in in the afternoon sessions. And we will see you again in one forty-five. So, thank you all for joining us. See you. <laughs>